we're now going to get into something new for everybody. And it's going to be angular momentum. All right? And the conservation of angular momentum. So quick refresher, we said that um, the change in momentum over the change in time was zero when the net external forces acting on the system were zero. Okay. Well, for angular momentum, which, and this doesn't make any sense to me at all, we use an L to describe um, the change in L over the change in time is equal to zero when the net outside torque on the system is equal to zero. Now, torques and forces are a little bit different. We will get into that distinction a lot more later. But um, let's say we had a very simple case of a stick. And we nailed that stick down. It was on a flat surface, and on that flat surface we rolled a ball towards that stick. Now, when the ball hits the stick, the whole thing's going to spin. But when the ball hits the stick, the stick's not going to move because it's nailed down. So in the case of the ball and the stick that's nailed down, the net outside force is not zero because of the thing that's nailed it down. But the net outside torque is zero. Um, torque you have to have, what would you say? Torque is a force times a radius, a perpendicular force to be exact, times a radius. Since this force is at the center of our spinning, there is no torque. And angular momentum in that case is conserved. So, we will have an opportunity to talk about that more. But when we have zero outside torques, angular momentum is conserved. So, let's talk about what angular momentum is by remembering regular momentum. Mass times velocity. Well, if we recall correctly, mass is just moment of inertia. Well, the, sorry, the rotational analog to mass is moment of inertia, and the rotational analog to velocity is angular velocity. So, simplest case, angular momentum is equal to moment of inertia times angular velocity. That's all there is to angular momentum. Um, it, it's it's very straightforward. Um, all we're going to do is say that the initial angular momentum of the system is equal to the final angular momentum of the system. There aren't really too many analogs for elastic and inelastic with this angular momentum thing. So things get difficult pretty quickly when we start talking about things that move in straight lines in relation to things that spin around. So let's say we have a wheel with spokes that we don't care about their mass. It has a radius of r, a mass m, and this wheel has a moment of inertia of i equals one half m r squared. Because, well, we do care about the spokes in this one. And I want it to be something other than m r squared. And let's say that we take and we have a dart. Now it's stuck around the center. We're going to take a dart darts look like that, I don't know. Dart has a mass of m over 2, and it's moving with a velocity of v. And when it hits, it's going to hit the very outer edge of the wheel. Now we all know common sense, when that thing hits, the entire system starts to spin. Well, each thing here has some angular momentum to begin with. The wheel, angular momentum to, for the wheel, is I times omega, which happens to be zero. Things are a little bit different for the dart. It does have angular momentum, and if the conservation of angular momentum is true, as this thing flies along its little path, that angular momentum has to be the same at all points. Now, once we find it, this is going to be a really simple problem to do. We just have to find out what that angular momentum is. First, so let's attack it by looking at I times omega in order to do that. <clears throat> this is a point mass moving about a center, right? So I for the dart, let's write this down, dart, moment of inertia for the dart is M times R squared. 
where in this moment what we'll call it big R uh, just to be nice and separate these two things out it's a distance of big R away from the center of that thing cool now we need to figure out what omega is well omega for this thing <clears throat> is V over R. V over R. But we have to be pretty specific about that V. Okay. Um, let's see if we can draw this here. Here's our radius R. Well, I need that space. Here's our little radius R. And that's, here's our object. If my velocity is in this direction, that's my velocity. I don't care about every part of it. Okay. I really only care about the perpendicular component of the velocity. That's going to contribute to my omega. The parallel part does not. I don't care about v parallel. It's not going to contribute to an omega. It doesn't look like a mass spinning around something on a string. What I want is v perpendicular. And if, if this is my angle here, this V perpendicular part is V times the sine of theta. We're going to look at this one more time before we're done, so don't worry. Um, so what I'm after is my perpendicular velocity. Well, same thing goes here. This velocity is this way. The radius is in this direction, big R. And I want V perpendicular. This is V perpendicular. So omega is going to be v sine theta over r. So the angular momentum of my dart is going to be i m r squared times v sine theta over r. So now I've got mv times big R times the sine of theta. Well, if we look at how this whole situation is constructed, here's my angle theta. There's big R. Big R times sine theta is the radius of that wheel. Mv little r. So the angular momentum for my dart is mv times little r. That straight line distance there. Well, guess what? As I move to this point, theta changes, big R changes. But the radius of that wheel remains the same. So the dart is going to have constant angular momentum as we go into this. That's pretty cool. Now that we have the angular momentum of everything, we can do this problem. So I'm going to erase all this information up here. You've already written it down. Or you're not going to write it down. So what we have is that the initial angular momentum is equal to the final angular momentum and what we want is how fast the wheel is spinning after the dart goes into it. <clears throat> so, the initial angular momentum is uh, in the mass of the dart, which is m over 2, times the velocity of the dart, times the radius of the wheel. The wheel doesn't have any initial angular momentum, and that's equal to the um, moment of inertia of the system afterwards times the speed of the system afterwards. Well, the moment of inertia is the moment of inertia of the wheel, one-half mass of the wheel times r squared, plus the moment of inertia of the dart spinning around the wheel, which we already said was m r, well in this case, it's going to be little r, little r squared, m over 2 times little r squared. One-half m r squared plus one-half m r squared is m r squared. So m r squared omega, 1r goes away, m's go away, and omega is equal to v over 2r. That's the correct units for omega, so that's good news. Um, but once we have the initial and final angular momentum, all we have to do is find the new moment of inertia of the system, and we're good to go. <clears throat> so before we move on to anything else more complicated, and we'll probably hold that for maybe a practice problem tomorrow, um, but uh, definitely another video about it tomorrow night. It'll be really short. I want to talk about finding the angular momentum of a particle moving 
uh, with respect to an axis or with respect to a fixed point. So the thing about angular momentum is that they're always taken about a pivot point for the entire system. So we have to name it. Most of the time that's going to be where something is uh, nailed down. If I'm throwing two objects together and seeing how they spin afterwards, that pivot is naturally going to be the center of mass of the entire system. So there's our pivot. Here's our mass. We'll just call it M. And it's moving. Well, that's not great. Normally wouldn't care about the straightness of the line, but it, it's going to help. So it's moving straight line velocity v which if you would follow the line of that velocity um, the line of that velocity and my pivot their closest point are a distance of a away let's call it that this will be an easy thing to identify in most problems that we see the distance from the pivot to the uh -oh, line of action of whatever's moving Okay, that's the line that's eventually going to be on. Now, there are two ways to do this. We'll do the way that we just did. Um, L is equal to I omega. Having to look specifically at omegas. Um, I want to do a better explanation than I did on the previous page. If we have a mass that is spinning about a point. At any point, that's the radius the velocity is perpendicular to that. And the relationship that we were talking about before when we said um, omega was V over R, just our definition for omega, um, that had to do with this specific tangential velocity. Well, another way to say it's tangen tangential for a circle is perpendicular to the radius. That's why we can say that this is the perpendicular velocity. If we look at our system, that's our velocity. Um, this line represents the radius of our system. Okay. That velocity is not perpendicular to that radius. Part of the velocity is parallel. Okay, that would be what we call radial velocity. That doesn't do anything for us. The other part of that velocity Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to draw this on this thing. The other part of that velocity is perpendicular. That's what's going to go into this omega, the perpendicular. Well, <clears throat> in this case, from some some some. Ooh, some simple trigonometry, if that whole angle is theta, the perpendicular is equal to v times the sine of theta. So my angular momentum is equal to i, which is mr squared, times omega, which is v perpendicular, or v sine theta over r. Again, it's the perpendicular component of velocity because this relationship talks about tangential speed, uh, not, not any speed that's directed towards the center. One of our r's goes away, and our angular momentum is equal to m times v times r sine of theta. Well, in our, in our situation for this triangle, if this is r and this is theta, a is equal to r sine theta. Simple trigonometry. So our angular momentum is equal to m times v times a. Where a is the distance between uh, the line of action from the pivot to the line of action. Okay, that's one way that we can go about thinking of it. The other way is a definition you may or may not have already found in your book where it says angular momentum is equal to R cross P. 
<clears throat> this doesn't make a lot of sense to those of you who are not in Calculus 3, and even if you are in Calculus 3, you may not have gotten the cross products yet. Well, that does come pretty early. <clears throat> the cross product is a way to multiply vectors. <clears throat> I'm not going to make you do the matrix necessary in finding the cross product. It's not worth our time here. But um, for a cross product, what it deals with is things that are perpendicular to each other. Uh, the other way that we would write this is r cross p would be r p times the sine of the angle between them. See, the cross product is at a maximum when these two things are at right angles to each other. We talked about cross product a little bit last year uh, when we talked about magnetism. We'll continue talking about it that way. Um, what it says is that the angular momentum is at a right angle to the radius and at a right angle to the momentum. And it's going to be the biggest when the angle between r and p is 90. It prefers it to be uh, perpendicular. Well, So, <clears throat> angular momentum is RMV sine theta. Well, that's what we had down here, too. It's just another way to get to the same spot. Um, we can talk about that a little more, but either way we look at it, the angular momentum is going to be MV times A, where A is that straight line distance from the pivot to the line of action. And we're going to see this a lot, and it may or may not be a little bit confusing. Hopefully it won't be.